Martin Luther wasn't born yesterday. And he didn't pick All Hallows' Eve by accident. It also wasn't the first time that he posted his disputes on the front door of Castle Church in Wittenberg in the fall of 1517. Now, Martin Luther was born in 1483. And, and he, he was born to a wealthy family and was in a fairly loving home, one of many siblings, and eventually he went to study law to be a lawyer, and, and, and in 1505, he was uh, outside, and a storm came upon him, and in that storm, lightning was crashing all around, and he was absolutely terrified. He was someone who had a great intellect, but also struggled a great deal, a, a great deal with fear and anxiety. And so when, when that lightning storm hit, he was terrified, and he believed in that moment, he was filled with fear that God was out to get him. And so he called out to whatever he could think, and he made a promise. He didn't actually make the promise to God. He made the promise to uh, St. Anne, uh, and he promised, if, if you rescue me from this storm, I will serve you as a monk. And so he survived the storm, he became a monk, and in that uh, uh, Augustinian monastery, uh, he, he pursued the knowledge of God, and in the process, just became more and more depressed, because the gap, the chasm between him and this holy God be, just be, was so evident, so overwhelming, that no matter what he did, no matter what he was learning, no matter how he tried to apply it, it only seemed to increase. And so it really filled him with despair. Eventually he became a priest and eventually he left that monastery and became a professor. And he was uh, writing a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of works and he was giving a lot of lectures um, and, and he, because he was personally, uh, so he had personally experienced the utter despair of constantly striving and constantly failing. And there's really hardly a worse despair than that. When you know that there's a God, and the more that you learn about him, the more you realize how far you are from him. And so in your attempt to try to close that distance, you realize that you're only fa falling farther behind at the same time that you learn that he's greater than you ever imagined. And so for Martin Luther, that was a devastating and despairing thing until he began to, to understand some of the, the scriptures for himself. And, and you know, of course, that in, in Romans, he, he found truths of the gospel that he had really never heard taught before. And, and, and the same in the book of Galatians. And he spent a lot of time in Psalms as he was there in that monastery. And like I said, eventually he became a priest and a professor as he wanted to communicate uh, these truths that he was learning about uh, the, the, the truth of the gospel and the incredible love of God that was lifting him out of despair. And eventually in the process, he realized that there was a terrible, awful corruption in the Roman Catholic Church. And as he began to give these lectures and, and write books, he would, he would uh, be a voice to try to communicate to the masses of people who themselves had never heard the word of God in their own language because it was always shared in the high church language. There was no translation that they could read it in their own language. And, and as a result, as a consequence, they were very vulnerable to all kinds of uh, distortions and, and half-truths and twisted theologies. And so Martin Luther became a voice to communicate with a great passion that, 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 that there, there is, a, there is a, a cross on which the Son of God gave his life and that, that that work that Jesus did was enough and that putting your faith in him was the way to being reconciled with God. And these are things that were not talked about, not discussed. In fact, there were obstacles, more obstacles placed in the way of people who didn't really know but they just heard things from the Roman Catholic Church and, and there was all kinds of corruption. And, um, and, and so he would often, you know, communicate these disputes that he had um, with, uh, with, with the theologies that were being spoken that were so twisted and disruptive. Eventually, of course, Martin Luther, trying to communicate all these things, he was banned from Twitter. And so <laughs> he started posting on the castle church door instead, which was not an app, it was an actual church, and there was a door 
uh, there on Castle Church, and so he posted uh, various disputes uh, there on the door. And it was actually uh, not the, the October 31st in 1517. That was the first time he had done this. He had done it before. In fact, even earlier that fall, he had posted 97 statements disputing the, the, the twisted theological inaccuracies and the, the, the distorted uh, version of the gospel that was no gospel at all uh, there on that door. And then I guess maybe he decided that 95 or 97 was probably too many. I know sometimes you think that I have a 97-point sermon, and, uh, and so if I do, then I agree with Martin Luther, that's probably too many. So he decided to scale it back next month, and he went with 95. <laughs> so on October 31st, 1517, he, he posted these 95 statements or 95 theses, and, and, and that was not an accident that he picked that particular day. Because one of the problems as he was communicating these things and posting these things even on the door was that, you know, people couldn't read them. And the people who uh, had influence and the people who could read and the people who, could, uh, who, who were, were, were wealthy and had uh, uh, power and the places of position and the people whose, whose voices were controlling the society weren't there. But you see, on All Hallows' Eve, they would be there. Why? Because they were, they were taught things that were wrong. It, it actually began with a pretty good idea all the way back in the year 609. The Pope at the time oh, wanted to uh, acknowledge that there were many believers, many Christians, especially in those first several hundred years of Christendom, that were martyrs. They had, they had lived and died in their testimony of Jesus. And so oftentimes what would happen is those those events, uh, it wasn't just, you know, one here and one there, but a lot of times uh, Christians would be uh, gathered up and rounded up and, and martyred all together, and there were these horrible events that, that became benchmark dates. You know, we have those in our culture for sure, benchmark dates, that this is the date that we lost so many people in such a tragic and horrendous way. We know that our, our uh, Jewish brothers and sisters have a, a new benchmark date in their calendar, that on that day, and many others follow. Well, that was a, a day that was set aside to, to commemorate uh, not just, you know, the, the many who had died on that particular day, but on, on, all, on all of the days that the Pope decided we need to have a day to commemorate all of the martyrs that had lived and died in their testimony of Jesus. And so he picked November 1st. And so for a long time, November 1st was that All Saints Day. And the day before, of course, was the eve of that, and that was, became known as All Hallows' Eve. And, uh, and, and that day was a day when people would flock to uh, their churches and their cathedrals to honor these saints. But one of the problems is because of the twisted and distorted versions of the, a, a, a false gospel that was put out by a church that had a lot of control and no one had access to the word, what they began to do was manipulate people to believe things that aren't true at all in God's word. And they believed that they would get closer, they would have more favor with God if they could get some of the saints who had been martyred to, to vouch for them in heaven. And so one of the things that happened is people began to really revere them at an entirely different level. It went from, being, from honoring these ones who had given their lives because of their testimony of Jesus to, to actually now idolizing these people and, and, and they would collect certain relics and things that belonged to them, and they would, they would hold them as precious, and people would collect them in cathedrals, and churches would collect them, and whoever had the, the largest, uh, most impressive collection of relics from these saints would be the places that a lot of people would go. And it happened that one of the largest collections was there at Castle Church, over 5,000 relics from these saints that had, had gone before. And so people would come, and especially the wealthy, the powerful, the influential, the ones who were shaping society were the ones who had access. How did they get access? They bought it. They were the ones who could read. They were the ones who, who, who were, had the education, and, they, and, 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 and yet they themselves did, also didn't have the, the, the gospel, the word, in, in their language. So they, even they were being duped at the time let alone all of the other masses. And so they would come to these places, and the reason why Martin Luther picked October 31st in that fall of 1517 is because he knew the place would be packed. 
That was the day that all of these people would be here. And so he cut his 97 down to 95, and he posted there on the, uh, on the door these 95 statements. And uh, among the several things that he, he took issue with, most importantly, or maybe most significantly, was, was the concept of indulgences. And, and this was an idea that, that sounded right to people. And I know that for, for, a, for a church like ours, you know, we might hear this idea and we go, like, how could people think that? But, but it, it sounded right. And I think that if we did not have this written word, it would, it would sound right to us too. In fact, it's really just a version of almost every worldview that mankind has ever invented. And it's only the one that God has written that sounds any different. So the concept of indulgences was basically this. Everyone has sin, including all the people who had died and gone before. And they go to a place of punishment, and so will you. So if you buy, just, you know, you give an offering. You, put, you give some money to the, to the cathedral fund. A lot of those cathedrals built in that era were funded through indulgences. If you give some money, then, then the, the, the pope with his, uh, with his authority would would delegate it through all the bishops and all of the, 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 the local uh, priests and allow them to absolve you of a proportionate amount of your sin according to your financial gift. And what's more, if you didn't think that that was something that you wanted to do or you needed to do, you definitely felt that the ones that you loved who had died before you were probably being punished for their sin. And that gap just seemed so big as they, as they heard more and more about this awesome and holy God and how wicked and, and sinful they were. They realized, my loved ones are suffering right now. I need to give. I need to give so that their time of punishment would be reduced. And imagine thinking that, that if you don't, that the ones that you love would suffer all the more. How could you not, right? Right? It made sense. And, and why take the risk, even if it didn't make sense? And so that's what people did. And Luther took aim at that, and he was, he was so angry, so passionately angry about this. Think, church, about the songs we were just singing together. I mean, you, you can barely contain yourself, right? When we sing about the great gospel of Jesus, our Savior, the Lamb of God, who came in and took our place, took our sin to the grave, took our sin to death and hell, and he himself took our death there and raised to life again, and now we have that new life and a hope of eternal life because of him. Imagine knowing that as Martin Luther was discovering in Scripture and then watching as from the wealthy classes all the way down through the, the poor masses of people had no access to that true gospel because they were told they had to buy it. And no matter how much money they gave, it would never be enough. Can you imagine how, how furious that would make Martin Luther and others of the reformers like him? He was so angry at this and and he understood that it was a wicked lie straight from hell. A false gospel is an empty and a cruel and a satanic power. It's a flimsy fortress. He wrote as one of those statements, those who believe that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be eternally damned together with their teachers. Well, mission was accomplished, <laughs> and more so than Luther could have ever predicted. And what happened was, uh, at the same, uh, the same time period, the printing press was, uh, was, was kind of coming of age now and, and, um, and had just been invented, and, and people had taken, unbeknownst to Luther, uh, those statements and began to publish them through the printing, printing press, and it was a direct hit on the heart of the Roman Catholic Church. He was called a, a wild boar, uh, loose in the vineyard of God. And eventually, uh, Luther was summoned by King Charles and all the church bishops to stand, stand trial for this in the city of Worms, and he was asked two questions. It was a trick, actually. He was invited to, to a, a debate, which he jumped at the chance to be able to, to, to articulate from Scripture 
But when he got there, what he found was that uh, copies of his writings had been all spread out on the table. And he walked in and he saw all of those things spread out to the table and they were asked, he was asked two questions. First one was, are these writings yours? And the second one, do you retract them? If you watched movies or uh, seen kind of dramatized versions of this, you see Martin Luther just bow up and produce this beautiful speech. He actually didn't in that moment. He did say to the first question, yes, they're my writings. To the second question, he said, basically, I don't dare answer that until I've had some time to sit back and reflect on what my answer should be. And so he was given a day. And that night, here was Luther's prayer. O oh, almighty and everlasting God, how terrible is this world. Behold, it openeth its mouth to swallow me up, and I have so little trust in thee. How weak is the flesh, and how power is Satan. If it is in the strength of this world only that I must put my trust, all is over. My last hour is come. My condemnation has been pronounced. Oh God, oh God, oh God, do thou help me against the wisdom of the world. Do this. Thou shouldst do this alone, for this is not my work, but thine. I have nothing to do here, nothing to contend with for these great ones of the world. I should desire to see my days flow peaceful and happy, but the cause is thine, and it is a righteous and eternal cause. Oh Lord, help me. Faithful and unchangeable God, in no man do I place my trust. It would be vain. All that is of man is uncertain. All that cometh of man fails, O God. My God, hearest thou me not? My God, are, are, are thou dead? No, thou cannot die. Thou hidest thyself only. Thou hast chosen me for this work. I know it well. Act then, O God, stand at my side for the sake of thy well-beloved Jesus Christ, who is my defense, my shield, and my strong tower. And after a further moment of struggle, he continues, Lord, where are you? O oh my God, where art thou? Come, come, I am ready. I am ready to lay down my life for truth, as patient as a lamb. For it is the cause of justice, it is thine. I will never separate myself from thee, neither now for th or through eternity. And though the world should be filled with devils, though my body, which is the work of thy hands, should be slain, should be stretched out upon the pavement, be cut in pieces, be reduced to ashes, my soul is thine. Yes, I have the assurance of thy word. My soul belongs to thee. I shall abide forever with thee. Amen. Oh God, help me. Amen. And he returned to that place and they asked him again, will you or will you not recant? He replied, since your most serene majesty and your high mightiness require from me a clear, simple, and precise answer, I will give you one. And it is this. I cannot submit my faith either to the Pope or to the councils because it is clear as the day that they have frequently erred and contradicted each other. I'm convinced that the testimony of Scripture or by the clearest, or unless I'm convinced by the testimony of Scripture or by the clearest reasoning, unless I am persuaded by means of these passages I have quoted, unless they thus render my conscience bound by the word of God, I cannot and will not retract, for it is unsafe for a Christian to speak against his conscience. And then looking around the assembly before which he stood, in which they held his life in his hands, in their hands, he said, here I stand, I can do no other, may God help me, amen. Don't think to yourself that Martin Luther was a fearless man. Quite the contrary. He knew in his own experience and people knew around him that he was constantly struggling with fears and anxiety and and, and, and a, 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 a crippled self-image, if you will. Well, we're going to fast forward to 1527. After having been rescued from that, uh, that, that event by some friends, 
eventually he was in a place where people had known about him and he was uh, somewhat protected, although very persecuted, uh, having become well known. And he had been now translating the Bible into German. And so for the first time, uh, for this, this uh, community, there would be an opportunity for people to read the word for themselves and be able to see for themselves what the gospel said, undermining all of the twisted false gospel that they had been told. He was always under the constant threat of persecution. And, and it was in, in 1527 that the bubonic plague was sweeping through Europe. And this, this incredibly vicious uh, pandemic struck the whole nation and beyond, and, 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 and many, many people died because of it. People were living in fear, and a lot of people were trying to escape his town looking for safety. They had no idea how to, how to contain it. But for Luther, who was, who was loving and pastoring people at the time, the issue was, should I, should I run like everybody else is doing, or should I stay and minister to those who remain, who are sick, and expose myself and my family to this deadly disease. And eventually he made that difficult decision that he would stay and shepherd the people there in that village. And together with his wife, Katie, they turned their home into a hospital for the dying. And tragically, their three-year-old son, Hans, contracted the disease, nearly died. And during this season, he became so overwhelmed so, so uh, mentally and emotionally despaired that he would sometimes faint at the dinner table uh, and, and would have to be carried away from it to his bed. And it was in the middle of this situation that he anchored himself to Psalm 46. It was weakness, a time of weakness, of, of pestilence, and in that, in that time he wrote, a mighty fortress is our God, as a testimony to the strength that he found in God himself. Intense anxieties, fears, and pressures, uh, there in their darkest moments, Luther would sometimes say to his friends and to his family, come, let us sing the 46th and let the devil do his worst. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft, his power are great. And armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. And were we to in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side. The man of God's own choosing. Doth ask who is he? Christ Jesus. It is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name. And from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. If you have a Bible with you, I want you to turn to Psalm 46 with me. And I'm going to read through this psalm from which that song was written. And I'd love to, for you to just have your eyes scanning it there in your, in, your, in your Bible or on the screen as I read this. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations that he's brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob, 
is our fortress. This is a good psalm for us to be reading these days, isn't it? Something that may not be obvious depending on the version that you're looking at or the the translation that you have in, in your hands is that this was written as a song. It was written in three parts. And so the sons of Korah, who were uh, it's a Levite family, a musical uh, a wing of the Levites, uh, had the task of writing songs for the people of God to sing his, his word back to them. And that's why this psalm was written. And it was written in those three parts. And if you have, say, an ESV and I think a couple of the other uh, versions, you'll notice that at the end of verse 3 and the end of verse 7 and the end of verse 11 all end with this little word, Selah. And we've talked about that before. We don't need to go into it much today. But, but that moment of Selah is a moment of pause. It's a moment to just sit and take it in. And so I don't know if you have, like me, I have, a, I have an NIV here. And yeah, there's a little space there. And it might be worth writing in that, that word, Selah, at the end of verse 3, at the end of verse 7, and the end of verse 11. Because it was intended to be sung and and to be read and to be shared together in in, in a way that when you get to those moments, you stop and you take it in. And that's one of the reasons why over the next couple of weeks, we're going to spend some time here in Psalm 46. And we're going to stop at those places and allow ourselves to take it in and allow this psalm to speak to us in the way that it was written to do. Well, those three parts uh, that you may have heard, there's, there's a picture I have that kind of helps me understand what's happening here. It's almost like there's uh, just this tremendous calamity, a giant storm or a, 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 a disaster that seems to be like rolling up over the hills or over the ridge. And everyone's, everyone's running for cover. And so in the first three verses, that first part is, is it's, it's basically saying, run, to cover, run for cover. We run to him. And then in verses 4 through 7, there's a description of basically what happens when we're in refuge in him. And then in verses 8 and 11, uh, there's a call from that place to let all the nations revere him. And one of the things that happens in that progression is that at first is a very personal thing. He's saying, first, we run to him, you and I. It's very personal. We each have a decision to make of where we run when calamity is threatened. Where we run when disaster is about to strike. Where we run with our fear, our anxieties, our worries. And so the the answer in verses 1 through 3 is we do. I do. You do. We have to decide that. And then in that second section that we'll get to in the following week, it talks about what what his people do. And then in the final section, it talks about what all the nations do in that process. So you see that progression, and it starts with you and me here and now. And basically, in verses 1 through 3, which is all, all we're, we're uh, touching on today, you have this picture when he says that uh, the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, the, the waters roar and foam, they quake with their surging. He's saying basically everything that you count on. That's what the picture is. For sure, maybe some of you have been in, in experiences where uh, maybe you've been in an earthquake or maybe you've, uh, you've been in some uh, horrible storm where you know, trees are falling all around you. Or maybe you've been very close to a, a, a lightning strike. Or just one of those times when, just in nature, there is this sudden, overwhelming reality of how very small and insignificant and powerless we are compared to this awesome creation in which we live. And so for sure, there, there, you know, that imagery is being used here, but it's not just about natural things. This isn't just about, hey, next earthquake that comes, turn to Psalm 46. Well, what he's talking about here, what the, the sons of Korah are talking about, is, is that in life there are things that we learn to count on. We all learn as we're growing up that there's some things that we can't count on. And we, we learn to adjust to that. We learn to adapt. But at the same time, we're also learning things that we can really lean on people that we know will be there, aspects of living in this world that will always be that way, uh, maybe organizations or institutions or things that, that, that we, we know how they work, we know how they go, and we can depend on them. You don't need me to start listing the examples of how all of that seems to be melting and crumbling all around us, but that's exactly what they're talking about, is when, when things that seem so solid are all of a sudden not solid at all. When things that seem so secure are all of a sudden the the greatest place of insecurity. 
Now, sometimes that happens in our individual worlds. Clearly, it happens in the whole external world. And so he, he, they're drawing our attention to, the, to those times in, in which it's like the whole earth is giving way. The mountains that, that you know, seem to endure all the things that happen in history. No matter what happens, you can look out and there's the mountain. At least I know where I am. He's saying, no, 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 even when that crumbles to the ground, falls into the heart of the sea, when everything that you could count on is all of a sudden gone, and you realize you can't count on anything, that's the situation that he's calling up to our minds. Everything that's solid isn't solid at all. And he's saying here, we will not fear. Why? Because the first two words of this psalm, God is. And that's significant and it's unusual. A lot of times the psalmist will share with us about you know, the struggles and the trials and the, the sufferings and the, the armies coming against him, all the things that he's enduring. And he'll often start with those. He'll say, you know, help me, God. There's, you know, this is happening. These armies are coming. Help me, God. These people hate me. Help me. They're out to get my life. You know? And he describes this situation. And then he comes around and he says, but God, I know that you're this way and I know that you'll be there for me and I know I can count on you. But here, the very first two words, God is. And the point is, when he says God is our refuge and is our strength, God as our refuge and our strength is who he is. It's not just a response to our fear. If you didn't exist, and if your greatest fear didn't exist, God still is refuge and strength. In fact, you could take out the word our right there for just a moment. God is refuge. God is strength. God cannot be not strength. God cannot be not refuge. So when he says God is our refuge and our strength, this is not a statement to say if you need, when you run into trouble, hey, if you need a fallback, if you need a hand, if you need a pick-me-up, God's able to help and to respond to you in your situation. If you and your situation never happened, never existed, God is refuge. God is strength. And isn't that what you want to hear when all the mountains are falling into the heart of the sea? This is who he is. It's not just a response to our fear. And then when he says God is our refuge and strength, we have to be careful here because the question is, well, who's our? Who's us? Right? We always want to be on the us side. We don't want to ever be on the them side. You know, in every Bible story, we all line up behind all the good guys. and We're like, yeah, those bad guys, they got drowned in the Red Sea, you know. Well, what side are you on? Maybe you would be an Egyptian. Maybe you would be a Philistine. Maybe in America, we don't have the privilege that we think we do to claim all of the promises that God gave to his people in Israel. Maybe what it depends on is what our relationship actually is to God. So the hour is actually a pretty important word, isn't it? God is our refuge and strength. Who is the hour here? This is not an us versus them question. The us, the hour here is anyone who would run to him. You see, some people run from God. We're all born doing that. And some people along the way we learn something. He shows us some aspect of his character, of his glory, of his holiness, of his call. We hear and we realize, no, actually, I can run to him. I can run into him. That's the best place to be. And so anyone running to him can say, God is our refuge and strength. See, whatever your refuge is just depends on whatever you're running to, right? And if you run to God as your refuge, then he's your refuge and your strength. What is a refuge in strength? In contrast to what we were just reading, it's an immovable, impenetrable, unshakable power to stay through the victory. Isn't that cool? God is our refuge and our strength. He's our immovable, impenetrable, unshakable power to stay through the victory. So while he calls us in to take refuge in him, he himself cannot be moved, cannot be shaken, cannot be penetrated in any way while he wins the victory and we watch him do it. And then there's this beautiful phrase, an ever-present help. Some versions say he's a very present help. Now think about this. 
a lot of times I try to figure out ways to say stuff. And usually, or often, I come up with more words than would have, would have been necessary. This isn't the sons of Korah trying to come up with ways to say stuff. This is God the Holy Spirit inspiring to them a self-portrait, a self-description of who he is. And he's saying, I am strength. I am refuge. And then he says, I am an ever-present help. This is his description, not ours. Hey, have you ever heard about God? He's really helpful. I've totally found that out. I would describe him as like pretty reliable. Go, go try that out. You know, this is not that. This is God saying of himself, an ever-present help. He's saying, I am very present. Much more present than the thing that's threatening you right now. That thing seems like it's bearing down on you so fast, so hard. You have wrestled, you have fought, you have lost, or you know that you have no chance of standing up against that. Or you see what's going on in your own world, and you're like, I do not know how this is ever going to work. Or you see what's happening in the outside world, and you go, we are doomed. All of those feelings, we all have those things. And God is saying, no, 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 I am way more present than that. I am very, very present. I'm in the midst I am extremely present. I am surrounding you and this whole situation, and I am within it. And when he says, I am a very extremely present help, he's not saying, so do your best, and I'll help fill in the gaps. That's not what it means when God talks about himself as a helper. What he means is, hold still. Hold still while I take care of this for you. And he holds us, and the entire the entire situation, he speaks and he accomplishes his will. Now, it, it, we, we often talk about how God is with us in our struggle. God is with us in the storm. That's very, very true. And then sometimes we even might look back and go like, where was God in this experience that I had? And we might think and pray and, and ask the Spirit to reveal to us, you know, wh wh Jesus, where were you in this time? And there's a sense in which, you know, there's, you, 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 you ask him and he and he can, he'll reveal to you what he was doing, what his, what his heart was for you in that moment, and that he, he didn't leave you alone. But you know, I really think that when we get to see it all clearly, it won't be even just that, hey, Jesus was there with me in the fire. But I think what we're going to see is like, he's holding us. And there's my entire life right there in the palm of his hand. And the entire world everyone and everything in it, but he's got me and my whole life right there. How present is God? How big does his hands need to be to hold your whole life just like that? So it makes sense that he would say, oh, no, 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 trust me, I am very there. Well, how there are you? Well, you just stomped on his palm. <laughs> he's, I'm very there. I am extremely present. You let me speak and you hold still. Finally, he says, in, in trouble. The word there means tight places. Claustrophobes in here. It's a scary thing. It's one of my scariest things to think about. There's a recurring dream I have about getting into a tight spot. I'd tell you about it, but you're not going to sleep for weeks, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> it's a good word for trouble. Tight places where you can't maneuver. There's no way out. You, you, you found yourself squeezed and crushed and, and without an escape. But here's the question. Where is God an ever-present help? How do we know that God is an ever-present help, a very extremely present? Where, where do we find him as an ever-present help? Well, it's in trouble. So, so what, if we, what if we're viewing trouble wrong? Hardship, suffering, frustration, conflict, pain, grief, struggle, we all hate that stuff. And we run from it. We avoid it. We protect ourselves from it. We run from it. We hate it. But what if God sees trouble differently than we do? What if as we see looming trouble, God sees leading to triumph? What if there's something greater that he's doing than the thing that you're afraid of? 
What if he's already rescued you, promised to you that he'll see you through it, and he wants to put his glory on display in the earth? What if our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us? Romans 8. What if while the whole world is shaking, we already have an unshakable fortress where fear does not run rampant? What if we say, instead of, it sure is looking bad, these sure are bad times. What if instead of saying, I don't know, this doesn't look good, or I don't think, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what we're going to do. Better start doing this. Better start saving. Better invest in gold. You know, whatever, I don't know. What if instead of that we say, Let's sing the 46th and let the devil do his worst. I think that as we see the world in great turmoil, one thing that comes to my mind frequently is the world is going to need some fearless Christians. But the fact is, is that even if the world weren't in turmoil, every single one of us, our own world will sometimes be in turmoil. Severe trouble. And some of you, you're in that right now, and if you never turn on the news, you already have more than you can handle. I get it. But what if we sing the 46th? A mighty fortress is our God. The God of Jacob is our fortress, extremely present, holding me there, speaking to that and telling me to just be still. What if we sing the 46th and let the devil do his worst? I do think that the world is going to need some fearless Christians, but I am not telling us, so let's just grit our teeth and let's get brave and bold and loudmouth, please no. I'm just saying that fearlessness is impossible outside the fortress. Fearlessness is only possible inside the fortress. And what these first three verses are saying is, we run to him. And so let me close by saying, how? How do we do that? There's more to it than this, I'm sure, but here's just two things that I want to lay out before you before we go. Number one, I think that a lot of people, you know, we we hear like we're not supposed to compare ourselves uh, to others and everything, and okay, that's good, that's good advice. My advice to you this morning, to me and my own heart is, compare yourself. The problem isn't that we, that we we shouldn't compare ourselves, the problem is that we compare ourselves to the wrong threat. Don't compare yourself to other people. Don't compare yourself to the perceived threat. Compare yourself to God. I mean, just straight up. Just start comparing, literally, in your mind, just start comparing yourself to God. You know what's going to happen? He's going to get real big, real quick. And you're going to get real small, real quick. And you're going to find, I feel way safer in the palm of his hand. I read this to you the other day. I want to share it with you once more. My resources are limited, my words fall short, my character is flawed. My perspective is narrow, my understanding is questionable, my courage is fickle. My empathy wears thin, my time is short, my attention span a joke. My strength is quickly exhausted, but his supply is endless abundance. His word is sharper than any two-edged sword. He's the king of righteousness and his vision is flawless. His wisdom is indisputably perfect. He's a consuming fire whose compassion never fails. He holds time and eternity in his hands. He is so graciously patient, and he reigns with all power and glory. You see, this is what I'm talking about. Literally in your mind, begin to compare yourself with the one who is a much bigger threat than anything else that you see out there. Jesus Christ is the risen Son of God. He conquered death and hell. He's risen from the grave. And trust me, he is way bigger of a threat to hell than anything on this planet is a threat to you. So go ahead. Compare yourself to God. Let yourself get small in the palm of his hands and let him get big. And finally, hide yourself. Three really simple little prayers. One sentence prayers. Here's how you hide yourself. In him is your refuge. You are right here with me, aren't you? Let me say that again. You're right here with me, aren't you? You will save me through this, won't you? 
you really love me, don't you? You are right here with me, aren't you? You will save me through this, won't you? You really love me, don't you? And you know what you're going to hear? I am. I will. I do. And that's when you're in refuge. Lord Jesus, what you did for us, we could have never imagined, never predicted, never written that script. You knew it. You became it from the beginning. We have a champion in you unlike any other. And you've become a greater threat to all of hell than anything that comes against us. So Lord, teach us how to take our refuge in you. You really are here with us, aren't you? You really will save us in this, won't you? You really do love us, don't you? Amen.